Well, hey, friends, welcome to Vintage Truth, and uh, we're studying the book of Ephesians together, and we're in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to dive into that in just a minute, uh, but before we get there, just want to give you a quick update on what's going on with our studio. As you know, if you've been a part of this ministry, uh, you know that we're in um, uh, major, you know, get out of here mode, just simply because we're so cramped, and I can almost reach out and touch my walls on either side. We're so cramped in here. Uh, but God is is working, and many of you have responded, and uh, we are we're over a third of the way there uh, towards our goal that we need to reach in order to lease this property that we've identified. And we're praying that no one snatches it up ahead of us, and if, and if they do, <clears throat> which is the perfect place for us, but if they that happens, then we just go to Plan B and ask the Lord to raise up a new spot. Uh, but either way, uh, we're over a third of the way there, and I want to thank you, you guys who have who've contributed towards this for one-time gifts and also who've come on board to say, Jeff, you can count on me for a monthly uh, because that's our greatest need right now. Obviously, the one-times we can take and divide out over the months, uh, but it's the the, uh, the monthly commitments that says, Jeff, you minister to me, you bless me, uh, you help me in my walk with Jesus, and so I want to help you. And that's basically what's going on. Uh, so uh, go to jeffkinley.com. You can uh, donate uh, on the website there, or if you, if you need to know more, watch that little short video on my website as well, and that'll give you more info, and I can send you even more info if you want it. Okay, so there's that. Uh, secondly, I uh, just came back from a great conference in Mississippi. Uh, almost 300 showed up uh, for this incredible uh, Bible conference, Prophecy Conference, and uh, <clears throat> it was just an amazing time together, and just the questions that people ask, and the fellowship that we had, and the sessions that we enjoyed together uh, were just phenomenal. And uh, I'm just, my entire year is completely booked up. It's crazy. Uh, and uh, I'm booking, uh, already booking many, many events already in 2025. So if you or your pastor are interested in bringing me somewhere, then now is the time to contact me to get it on the calendar because uh, 2025 is already starting to, to book up. Okay, let's talk about uh, the book of Ephesians here. So, so we're in Ephesians chapter four, <clears throat> excuse me, and we've been talking about the role of the pastor, what the pastor does, and what the pastor does, how it affects us in our lives. And we were talking about the fact that when a pastor uh, equips his congregation, uh, and not just give a sermon, I'm talking about really giving them the meat of the word, digging into the Bible, uh, hopefully verse by verse, doesn't have to be every time, but but just, you know, it get, gets the flow and the context of each scripture that he's expositing. When that happens, we are unified around the truth. And it says that we uh, begin to attain the maturity that comes with what a mature Christian is. And I talked about in just a previous podcast, I mean, how, you know, Paul's prescription for, for spiritual maturity. And there is a way to become mature in Christ. And if you don't follow that way, you're going to have a pseudo sense of maturity, a, a false or a, a, a faux maturity, if you will. Uh, there's going to be a sense which you think you know stuff, but you really don't. Uh, I had a lady come up to me a couple of weeks ago and just said, 90% of what you said today, I've never heard in my entire life. And, and it's right there in my Bible. And I never knew it because no one ever taught it to me. Well, a lot of people think they're spiritually mature because they've been to church a lot or they're spiritually mature because they know a couple of things. But spiritual maturity comes, number one, it comes over time. Uh, secondly, it comes over uh, continuous exposure and interaction and assimilation of the truth of God in Scripture. So you can't get that just from a Sunday morning sermon. Now, that's a great place to, to have kind of a launching point, but you got to get that in your own life. That's why it's so important for you and I to under, understand how to be self-feeders, right? Just with our children, you know, we, we feed them when they're little. We feed them, a, you know, a breast, a bottle, a little pureed food, you know. Then we chop up little chicken nuggets and hot dogs and give them to. And then as eventually they can uh, pick up a fork themselves and feed themselves. And then eventually they go off to college or become, you know, single or whatever. And, and guess what? They're preparing their own meals. And then they're preparing them for someone else. So, you know, that's how spiritual food is done. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> when a pastor or a teacher, like I'm doing with you right now, prepares a meal or a Wednesday night Bible study that I teach, I prepare a meal for that every Wednesday night. Or a message that I prepare when I go and speak or a book that I write. These are things that are prepared. And what I want to do is not to chew up the food too much for you, okay? I, I, I want to cut it up for you maybe, 
Uh, but I don't want to chew it up because I, I want you to chew it up. I want you to digest it. You take the truth and you let that marinate in, in your in your mind. And then you let it kind of seep down into your soul and your heart and your actions. And then you learn to do that for yourselves. Well, that's part of the job of a pastor to do that. It says we become mature people. Then it says in verse 14 that, that as we talked about last time, <coughs> excuse me, that we're no longer tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine. You know how sick you get on a, on a ship if it does that all the time? Well, that's the way people get, spiritually speaking, is that they just get the waves come, they go this way, the waves come, they do this way. I remember when this whole... Um, uh, you know, uh, BLM thing came along, Black Lives Matter or the pandemic or whatever it might be. And so many Christians or, or just fads that come through Christianity, you know, uh, fads of the Enneagram or all these weird little, little philosophies that come seeping into the church. And people just, they just go tossed to and fro instead of maintaining the course that God has set for them. Well, guess what? That's the result of being taught properly. And, you know, when I travel around to churches, listen, it is abundantly clear which churches already are with me and, and already uh, are able to track in the scriptures. And others <clears throat> I go to is like I stepped off a spaceship, you know, with the truth I'm bringing just right out of the verses here. So it's easy to know which churches have been already taught well. That's the point. And uh, thankfully, I get to go to a lot of good churches that have that have been taught very well. I know a lot of great pastors uh, but but guess what? Sometimes I'll go to church and and this is all new stuff and I'm glad to give it to them. Uh, but but it's something they're learning. In fact, the pastor sometimes was like, man, I never knew that. That's that's pretty cool. And so that's what the effect of good teaching does. <clears throat> it keeps you from uh, being deceived, deceitful scheming. It says here, uh, it keeps you from being tossed by every wind of doctrine. And the winds are blowing all the time. Winds are blowing outside right now, in terms of doctrine. So being grounded in the word is the best way uh, to avoid that. Now we get to verse 15 here. Instead of being deceitfully uh, deceived by, by these deceitful uh, tricks of men uh, and craftiness, he says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. So the antidote to scheming, the antidote to craftiness, the antidote to deceit, and deceptful, deceptive doctrine, the antidote is truth. Truth spoken in love. <clears throat> I love this. This is so great because the Word of God is all you need to do battle against the principalities and, and the, the, um, uh, the fortresses, rather, that Satan and his principalities are propagating in the world today. It's not it's not clever thinking. It's not a quick wit. It's not a steel trap mind. It's speaking the truth, knowing the truth of God. So that's your, your greatest weapon. As we're going to see in, in chapter 6, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon that, that Paul prescribes for our battle, our day-to-day -day battle. But notice he says here, speaking the truth in love, in love. And this is very important. Because we can speak the truth in anger. We can speak the truth in hate. We can speak the truth in spite. Uh, we can speak the truth with manipulative guilt or manipulative uh, emotions. Or we can speak the truth theatrically. You see what I'm saying? There are many ways to speak the truth. But he says, speak the truth in love. What does he mean by that? <clears throat> what he means is this. You speak the truth, number one, in a loving way. Uh, you do it lovingly. We're not, you know, the Bible is not a giant hammer that we walk around and just crack people over the top of the head with. We don't use truth as a, as a gotcha or as an aha or, or as a, you know, a dig to people. We, we speak the truth to people in the spirit of love. Why? Because the truth wants to set people free. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. That's a loving thing to do to people who are enslaved. And so when you come in and you're, and you're trying to help people <clears throat> get out of sin and to be free, that I hope that means you love them. So you, you do it in a loving manner and you do it because you love the people. Uh, I've known pastors who are, who are not very loving to their people. 
they just simply want to get up and just regurgitate a message and they don't care that in fact they use their anger and they use their uh, their theatrical uh, pedagogy if you will uh, to to try to to corral and manipulate and their powers of persuasion now watch this for a second there are men and there are women too that that, that are out there too that are, that are teaching <clears throat> there are people who are very powerful in their ability to persuade others. They do that because they are very articulate. Uh, they have great uh, speaking skills. Uh, they have great communication methods. Uh, they have great uh, presentation, uh, presentations that they give. They have great outlines, memorable outlines, whatever it might be as in the way they present it. <clears throat> but watch this, all of those things they can be used in some ways by God in terms of the your skills and that type of thing. But if there's not love there, then all of that is just, it, it's lost. It gets burned up. It's n there's no substance really to it. If you're listening to someone and you truly believe that that person loves you and that the spirit that this teaching is coming from, this truthful teaching <clears throat> is coming from, is done in love, then, then number one, you're 10 times more likely to, to accept it. And then secondly, you're obviously more likely to assimilate it into your heart and believe it, and then to go live it out in your own life. Well, that's part of what he's saying here is that the way that we overcome evil out there in the world and bad teaching and bad doctrine is not saying, don't believe that, that's wrong. Well, okay, but give me the truth then. Give me the, the antidote to it. Don't just say, Oh, you're, you've been bitten by a snake. You've got poison in you. You shouldn't have been near that poison. You shouldn't have listened. To, you shouldn't have gotten near the snake. Um, but it's another thing to say, wait a minute, let's get you to the hospital and get you some antidote here. That's what the truth is here. The, the truth counteracts the negative consequences of false teaching and a bad doctrine. And so that's why he says speaking the truth in love. And why else does he say love? A third reason, not only in the spirit of love, not only because you love those people, but because in the body of Christ, uh, love is everything. And when I say love is everything, I don't just mean forget everybody, everything else and just do love. I mean, if you really love someone, you're going to speak the truth to them. Uh, in fact, he says over in verse 25, as we'll see later on, he says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. The reason why we need to speak truth is because as bodies, as a body together, the body of Christ, if if we don't speak truth and that and that part of the body begins to atrophy or begins to be diseased or become cancerous or become useless, it affects us because he says we're connected, we're, we're linked into each other. And, you know, when he says we're members of one another, the imagery in my mind is not just of a body, which is the imagery here, but it's the idea that you're climbing this cliff together or you're climbing this, this mountain together and we're all hooked into each other. Now, what that means is that if one person ahead of you falls, guess what is going to happen to that? He's going to start pulling on the rest of you. Doesn't mean the rest of you are going to fall, but it means you're going to feel the weight of that. You're going to feel the weight of that person. If they're just dead weight, guess what? You're going to feel that carrying it up the mountain. And so when we're members of each other in the body of Christ, we affect each other. So we need to speak truth, always speak the truth, even if, it, if it, it's at the risk of a relationship. And, and many times it is the risk of a relationship. Uh, there have been times when <clears throat> I've been asked a question. Sometimes it's a loaded question. Sometimes it's a baited question, but been asked a question to explain a, a passage of scripture. And I explain it very clearly. And this person holds another view. And, and when I say another view, not just another uh, debatable view, but an absolutely unbiblical view, they don't like what I said, even though I've spoken the truth to them in a spirit of love. And guess what? They don't come back. And that's on them. Because when you speak the truth, then, then the burden is on the person who receives the truth and, and receives the love to take it as it is and face value truth spoken in love. There's no trick behind this. It's just simply speaking the truth. I have no agenda here other than just to tell you the truth. 
And so there's no back end, you know, benefit from telling you the truth other than the fact that you get blessed, you know. And so that's what the Bible does for us. That's what pastors do for us. That's what good Bible teaching does for us. And it says, speaking the truth in love, what happens? We grow up, it says in verse 15. We grow up in all aspects in him. So you see how truth is like this little, truth is like tributary, uh, tributary rivers, that little streams that feed all your body, like capillaries, if you will. Uh, truth just kind of goes everywhere into your body, uh, in, into your spiritual body, and, and into your mind, and into your life. And that's why it's so important to always speak the truth uh, to one another. What is the truth? It's not my really fancy opinion. Uh, the truth is God's Word. And that's the only thing I can absolutely count on in terms of, of, of life and, and that type of thing is God's word because it's it's from the Lord and all scripture is inspired by God. He says that we grow up into the head who's Christ. Now verse, uh, verse 16, speaking of Christ now, it says, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The building of itself in love. Now, I want you to notice several things about verse 16 here. Number one, it says the whole body. So you and I are a part of a larger body of Christ. You may be a part of a local body, but even if you're not, uh, you are a part of the larger body of Christ. That's why I like it. This conference we were at last weekend where people came from Mississippi and Louisiana and Ohio, they came from all over. And what happened? Just I mean, instant fellowship because the pieces fit together uh, because everybody was speaking the truth in love. Everybody was, you know, there for the right reasons and that type of thing. We're all part of the, the whole body of Christ. It says we're fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. So wait a minute. Every one of us is like a joint uh, in a body uh, in, in terms of we connect to one another, okay? A, a joint is something that connects, it's a joining point. It connects one part of the body to the other. And it says that which every uh, part or every joint supplies. Did you notice it didn't say that, in, in, that which every joint or every member consumes or receives? It says supplies. So that tells us that every member in the body of Christ has a biblical obligation to help the body, to help the body. And you know, friends, listen, I'm just going to be brutally honest with you for a second. And this is a little bit out of character for me, okay? But I just want to tell you this right now, that when I say things like, hey, we want to help bless the body of Christ by doing bigger and greater things in this ministry, like getting to this a new studio, that's not my nature to talk like that, to, 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 to ask people for things, because I, I tend to, to want to just, well, if God wants them to, he'll do it. Uh, but I've been encouraged by many people say, no, Jeff, you need to tell people about the need. But here's the deal. When I ask you, would you consider supplying, supplying, which is what it says right here, would you consider supplying? The reason I do that is not because of me because I don't receive that. I don't get that. I don't get that benefit. It goes to the body of Christ. It, it enables me to have the tools I need to help supply to the rest of the body of Christ in, in my own way, in, in the way that in which God has directed and empowered and, and positioned me to give. So I'm just a funnel. I'm just a, a messenger through which, you know, the message goes. But when we partner together in the body of Christ, a greater portion of the body is supplied. So there's a difference there between uh, supplying stuff for, every, for other people and just consuming stuff for yourself. So right now I'm supplying and you're uh, in a sense receiving or you could say consuming, but it's more like you're partnering and, and, and uh, supplying or excuse me and receiving. Uh, but then you get a chance to supply as well. And so anyway, all that to say is we all get a chance to be in the game. That's, that's the cool thing about it. God says everybody gets a chance to contribute, everybody. And nobody's on the sidelines, nobody's sitting on the bench. Uh, God wants everybody on the field. God wants everybody, you know, suited up, ready to play uh, at all times. And uh, that, that to me is part of the beauty of the body of Christ. And, and it makes a beautiful body. It really does. It makes our body beautiful. When you know that, that each member of the body is going to help each other member of the body. I've, I've told, you, told you this 
probably many times before, and I've told my Wednesday night group this, is that years ago when I had um, when I had this uh, this mission church in the city, we we're reaching Gen Zers, and I used to say to them, I say, look, I want us to be so close and so connected to each other in this little church that whenever someone over here on this side of the room stubs their toe, I want to hear somebody over on this side of the room say, ouch. That's how connected we want to be. And that's the idea here is he says every joint supplies. Everybody has a part. In fact, he goes, he says that again, according to the proper working here of each individual part. Now notice what each individual gets to do in the body of Christ. He says each individual part causes the growth of the body, causes the growth of the body. So it's not just like you're just making a contribution. You are actively participating in the spiritual growth and the bodybuilding of the family of God. How incredibly privileged is that, that, that you and I get the opportunity to cause spiritual growth in other people. And listen, here's the cool part. The cool part is you half the time you don't even know that's happening. Half the time you don't even know how God is using you. All you do is show up and do what you're supposed to do. You just be you the way God has made you and the way God has spiritually gifted you, the way he has uh, educated you and equipped you from others. Now you take that and help other people. That's all you got to do. Please don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to do someone else's ministry. Do, do specifically what God's calling you to do. And listen, God may not reveal all of that to you in, in one fell swoop. You may have to just simply be obedient in what you know right now. And then that leads to other things. And I'll just tell you as a word of personal testimony, that's been my journey. I mean, I've, I've been, uh, I was a pastor uh, as soon as, well, before I even got out of seminary, I was a pastor. But, but after that, just knew my life calling uh, was to help equip the body. And for over 30 something years, I did that as a pastor in the local church. And, and then God said, all right, I'm, we're going we're gonna to take this thing global and, and uh, kind of expand it. And so, I, you know, from the books, I was already writing books at the time, and I didn't know how God was going to do that. You know, I prayed God to help me you know, get the speaking and writing ministry up and going and stuff. But, but God just, God made it clear as we went along and he gave success and, and blessed, greatly blessed different areas of my ministry. Well, here I am. And what am I doing now? As I, I'm simply saying, well, I'm going to take the next step. Is all I know to do is take the next step, you know, and getting the studio thing going and that kind of thing. Why? So that I can help prepare the bride. So I can help wake the bride, prepare the bride, equip the bride, encourage the bride, and help propel the bride out into the world uh, to help her reach others for Christ. Uh, that's what he says here. He says, each individual part. So just know all I'm doing is doing my part. All you need to do is do your part. And sometimes we come together for it, don't we? So we, we can partner together and I can help you and you can help me and we can make a huge difference in the world for Jesus Christ. And then he says this, he says, each individual part uh, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You know, it's the third time he's mentioned the word love here. And I love that because what he's saying is, is that love is a great thing. You know, I mean, when, when you're with other believers and you're experiencing love, I mean, people, of course, you know, I'm, I'm always the speaker when I go places, but people are always coming up to me, people I don't know, and they'll say things like, you know, I recognize that voice or there's you, there are you in person. I've been watching you on TV for years and now I get to meet you and you're one of my favorite authors or you're my, you're my pastor or my online pastor or whatever it might be. And, you know, you know, I feel an instant connection with even when they don't compliment me, I still feel an instant connection with them, but just coming up and just say, Hey brother, how are you? Thank you so much for your ministry. Keep doing what you're doing. And I just go, thank you so much. By God's grace, I will please pray for me. So, you know, we're in this thing together and that's why he says love here building up of itself in love. It's it's not a sin to build up your own body, your own physical body, to take care of your body, to, to eat right, to get a proper amount of exercise and rest, uh, and to take care of yourself. I mean, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. According to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We should take care of ourselves. Let's not, let's not abuse ourselves. Let's not neglect ourselves, right? Well, the same is true in the body of Jesus Christ, is that we need to do what we can do to help build up 
the body. I want to share one scripture with you, a scripture you probably heard before, and then next next time we'll pick it up in in uh, verse uh, 17 here. But in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and I love this because uh, he's speaking to believers that are kind of wavering on some different uh, areas, and he says in verse uh, verse 23 in chapter 10 of Hebrews, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. In other words, you got a sure hope, the hope of his return. Uh, he's coming back. Don't worry about that. It's going to happen. But don't waver on it. He says, and let us consider uh, how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. So in other words, let's, let's just pause and think about how can I help others in the body of Christ? Not how can they be helped how can I help them? Now, that requires a little bit of self-reflection, a little introspection. Maybe ask some other people, hey, what do you see about me that is that can help others or that is helping others in the body of Christ? You know, do what you got to do to find out. But to stimulate them to love and to good deeds, to motivate them, to encourage them, to model for them, to be an example for them of what it means to do good deeds to the body of Christ. It says, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of, of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day uh, drawing near. So here's the idea is that number one, he says, we can see the day drawing near. In other words, I, I think here is primarily talking about the second coming of Christ. And I think he's saying you can see out there in the future that the day of Christ, the day of his return to planet Earth uh, is, is drawing near. Why? Because of all the emerging signs that we see around us right now. He says, that you can see the day drawing near means that you should do something. What is that something? Well, number one, keep coming together as believers. Number two, uh, encourage one another. But then he says, do it all the more. Because as time gets closer, and you and I know this, if you're if you're maybe older a little bit, you know, you understand the brevity of life and how the clock seems to be ticking faster. You ever notice that as you get older? Guess what? God is saying, when you see that, then he says, you need to press down the gas pedal more. As you get older, it's not an excuse for you and I to just simply lean back, get in the back seat, you know, just put it in cruise control, drive 20 down the road, you know, kind of think 20 miles an hour. Uh uh. Speed it up. Speed up the intensity and the frequency of your encouragement to the body of Christ. And that is what the Venice Youth Podcast is about. It's what Jeff Kinley Live is about. It's what the King is Coming is about. It's what the Prophecy Pros are about. It's what my books are about. It's what my traveling and speaking is all about. It's what my Wednesday night Bible study is all about. What? encouraging one another all the more. You know why? Because we're seeing the day approaching. So what about you? How can you be that, that connecting joint? How can you be that each individual part? How can you be that person who speaks truth in love to model for other believers, to stimulate them to love and to good deeds? And how can you encourage the rest of the body of Christ to be who they're supposed to be so that we can keep perpetuating uh, that kind of love atmosphere within the body. Well, I hope that really is an encouragement to you because it certainly is to me. My heart feels enlarged right now just from reading and studying this passage. So this is how we have a beautiful body and you can have one and you can be a part of one and we can all enjoy that together. I'll see you next time on the Vintage Truth Podcast. God bless.